is uh, March 12th, and we will be discussing at MS Office Hours um, how to start helping you onboard teams, start automating that process a little bit. Then at the bottom of the hour, um, Manny will be on speaking about governance and policies. So for some folks onboarding onto teams, there's been some challenges. We want to have some controls around acceptable use and some other things. So uh, Seth Jewell, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Uh, can everybody hear me OK? Or at least, uh, David, if you can hear me, then I will uh, I get you going. Wonderfully. Better than you sound better than Preston. That's a high bar. <laughs> yeah, that is a high bar. So um, so let me share out my desktop real quick and I'll just walk through a quick demo. This shouldn't take long. Dave, you said it's about you we got about five, ten minutes, maybe. Yeah, that's fine. OK. All right, and then once you see my screen, I'll go ahead and walk through it. to your screen okay perfect so uh hey everybody so we had a couple requests i work with a lot of universities across south central uh, and then k-12s as well and one of the re requests that had come up is they want the ability for their faculty and staff and then in, in some instances students to be able to uh, create teams but they want to make sure that um, from an organizational standpoint that they make sure that the uh, the person that's requesting access to create a team in an Office 365 group has reviewed the organization's acceptable use policy. So uh, we worked uh, with one of our team's program managers and he came up with a solution um, that really just uses a Microsoft form uh, and then a flow on the back end and then we create that in a team's app uh, to give an easy way for um, a user before they have the ability to create a team to review the organization's acceptable use policy. Uh, and then we can automate them being added into the uh, the Active Directory Security Group or uh, Azure Active Directory Security Group that has access to create that Teams. And so what I'll demo real quick is um, I'm logged in with a standard user, so I, I believe it's Lynn Roberts. So if I go to my Teams at this point and I go to join or create a team, what you will notice is this user does not have the ability to actually create a team at this point. Uh, so if we look at our sidebar, you'll notice a uh, organizational branded app called UA, uh, AUP, so our, our acceptable use policy. I and mean, you can send this out. Um, you can target it or do it uh, via global policy, um, but pinning that app on the sidebar. And it basically just requires Lynn in this case uh, to review the organizational's acceptable use policy and accept those terms and conditions. And there's a lot of different things you can do here. We made just a basic one, but I can put like organizational branding here. I can embed a video in it. Uh, if you've got a video, you know, about all of your uh, organization's uh, policies around uh, acceptable use of technology. Uh, but at this point, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to have to accept the terms and conditions. And then once I submit it, my form response is going to be submitted. And on the back end, we're going to have a flow that runs uh, that adds Lynn Roberts to the group that uh, can actually create a team. And I'll just switch screens real quick and I will show you what the flow is doing. And this should just create, take a moment or two for Lynn to be added to that group. There we go. So what I've got is I've got gone into Power Automate and create a my team's acceptable use policy. And then again, that is based on our Microsoft form that we created. And if I edit that, you'll see it's really just four simple steps. I'm oh, sorry. It's in the wrong edit button. So it's going to take any time that a new form response is submitted. All I have to do is select my form ID. In that case, it was that acceptable use policy form that I created. I'm going to get the response details. So this is the list of responses. And at that point, I'm going to search for the user. So that form response will include the user ID. And then I'm going to search based on that user's ID, their email. And then once I have their email, I'm going to apply a control that says grab the value of that and then add that person to a security group. And in this case, I'm passing it my group ID. And if I looked in Azure Active Directory, that group ID is the group that is allowed to create team slash Office 365 groups. Uh, so that's really it. You've got those four simple steps. Once you've created your form, uh, you've created a flow and then you can create a app and we've got all this documented. And then once I've got that app, I can deploy it via Teams. So if I hop back over to my my user account, there we 
And if it works, I'll go to Teams now. And within a few minutes, I should this should be um, a company with a Create Team button. But uh, at that point, that's all you need to do from an uh, or organizational standpoint is pin this. Uh, and then once the group-based assignments work, you can actually um, you can do an exclusion group and then target this to only members of your organization that don't have the permission. So you can basically do a, a targeted uh, app setup policy that we're that'll pin this app only for users that don't have the um, the authority to create uh, a team or Office 365 group. And that's really it. Any questions on it? Uh, that's pretty quick, but. So um, I think you also did kind of a, a guide to that in terms of um, kind of the steps that somebody could um, follow. Do you, can you, sh is that something you can share out? I know it looked like a pretty good document. I was able to get that up and running in my demo tenant relatively quickly, Seth. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. So I've got a document that covers uh, really all of those steps from even, even if you don't have an, a dynamic or a Azure Active Directory security group set up uh, for group creation, um, it goes through that process, then it goes through the PowerShell commandlet that uh, assigns the permission that, that's required to create Office 365 groups and teams, and then it carries you through the rest of that process that we demoed. Uh, so yeah, I can share that out, David. If you want me to send that to you or Preston, uh, we should be able to share that out, um, you know, via email or or however you guys. Um, yeah, or you can even put it in the Teams channel, or uh, if you have that in a Word doc, I can I can move that in. So it. Um, and it was it was pretty good. You, you you know you got some feedback. So again, this this came out of the need right to address some of the challenges that we've been having. Where um, you know uh, some organizations may just turn it on, hey, create a team, do what you want to do. And in many 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 cases, you know we we have had folks ask for uh, you know a, a way to control that. Some folks want to put a little bit more structure around the teams, especially as we get into dealing with K through 12 students and some of the higher ed scenarios. So. Um, it gives you a certain amount of control, but it still allows you to um, create that dynamic environment without having necessarily people involved every step of the way in order to get them involved in, in what's taking place in teams. So appreciate it, Seth. Um, the, the details and instructions were pretty good. If Preston could probably do it by just what you heard for me, I had to go in and take a look at it because I don't drive a Chevy Neon, so I'm not as <laughs> quick and agile as Preston is, but uh, you know, it worked relatively well. So I uh, appreciate kind of helping out in that effort um, and we'll make sure to members of the community that we get that up on the uh, both within the team's uh, community call as well as with the uh, other folks. And so if you have questions, please feel free to come back to that. But again, that's one of those things that I've heard asked a couple of times, so thank you, Seth. Appreciate it. Hey, look at that. Did you create the team? Yeah. Yep, I've got the capability now. I just took a, a couple of minutes for that to, to get through. But. And 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 let's say that we had a standard structure that we, uh, you know, channel, whatever, you know, we could embed that in this workflow without all that much trouble as well, right? If need be. Um, so let's say that we want to have some common applications. Maybe we wanted to pull in Canvas. Maybe we wanted to pull in um, you know, I, I, any number of other uh, things, or if we had well, class schedules, for example, if we had integration with uh, school data sync or and OneNote. So, um, so good stuff. I like it. All right. Yep. Awesome. I'll, I'll share all the document. Awesome. Any quick questions for Seth on this piece? All right. I will take that as a no because nobody wants to be recorded. Seth, you were going to say something? Uh, nope, that's it. I was just saying I'll, awesome. I'll share out the document for you guys. Thank you very, thank you very much. Really appreciate it, and uh, thanks to the program leadership for kind of helping that, get some of that stuff out in the public wilds. Appreciate it, and uh, good luck keeping up with all the stuff coming in the front door these days. I I still have about twenty voicemails to get back to for folks that are in various uh, forms of changing their learning environment. So thank you, appreciate it. Excellent. Alrighty, so uh, then we're going to turn over to um, Manny. Uh, Manny, if you can come off mute. Yes, sir. Hey, Manny, how are you? Um, I, I'm well. Wow, wow, you you must have. Did you have a bit of a vacation for a little while? You know, I'm just always chilling. It's just man, I like it. The, the, there's I a lot work of well under pressure. Let's put it that way. There's there's a lot of bearding going on in the uh, in Microsoft land. Wow. 
Um, you need to catch anyways. up, Perlman. <laughs> I, I, you know, I probably can't even grow one. But anyways, <laughs> so we asked Manny to come on, and again, we're gonna we're gonna get back to a lot of the questions that we have. Um, really, I asked Manny to come on just to give um, some guidance in terms of governance and policies. Um, you know, listen, on the Microsoft side, we'd love you to turn everything on. In fact, Manny was just kind of I am in me. Wow, just turn it on. Um, somewhere in between there and having him complete control is where most uh, organizations are kind of falling. Maybe there's some that are that organic that they're just turning them on all the time. I do have a school that's doing that and, you know, the adoption rates have gone up. But, um, you know, so I'll turn it over to you, Manny. Um, quick introduction on yourself and then uh, get at it. Yeah, cool. Manny Sandu, Microsoft Teams Engineering with a focus on, on education. So helping folks like David and Preston and their peers uh, really support our customers on what the broad adoption of Teams looks like, the governance and all that. So that's what I do on a on a regular basis. So, so my, my session really ties in very well to what Seth just talked about, right? So there's really multiple trains of thought of do we make this service available to everybody? Do we lock it down? Do we have a support ticket? Do we do some sort of automated flow process that that uh, that Seth just highlighted? I think I'm going to call, call the first part of my session a little bit of myth busting, right? Like if we do open it up, what what are the concerns that we're going to have? What should we what should we look at? So the first concern that we hear from a lot of administrators is, you know, what if teams explodes and like what if there's just way too many teams? So first thing I want to highlight that each organization, so each tenant can have a maximum of half a million teams. Uh, you can't exceed that. So that's your upper limit. And then each individual user, except for administrators, can only create a maximum of 250 teams. So those are some hard limits that we have in place. Administrators can bypass the 250 rule. They cannot bypass the half a million rule. As of last, I believe it was last June or maybe the year year before that, we stopped hiding the email addresses for the underlying group of the team in the gal, so we don't post it in the gal, and we as well as we do not uh, show the group uh, as part of your outlook, uh, as as typically groups are listed, right? So, a little bit about uh, the the sprawl factor. Next one is. I'm worried about how users will create names, right? And that that's fair. Whether you're worried about vulgarities or whether you're worried about institution specific words like provost or registrar or security or financial aid or you know your institution's mascot, whatever it is, you know, that's fine. We have a list of five thousand custom words in which you can upload and implement to be able so so they are not used when a user creates uh, a team, right? Uh, another cool trick that my colleague Nick called, uh, called out to us is every time you create a team, it's logged in the audit log. So as administrators, you can subscribe to a digest on a daily basis that says pull me all the teams that were created in the past 24 hours to do a manual check just to make sure things are, are good on your behalf and they fit your standards, right? I'm going to walk you through now a little bit of a team creation what happens when some of these policies are implemented and i'm going to build this build this out so in this example this is the team creation wizard for a non-administrator you'll see they entered the word financial aid they're getting a warning the name cannot contain financial that's because it's part of our custom block word list we've also implemented a naming policy now the naming policy consists of a suffix and a prefix or a combination of both or one in this example, we use the AAD attribute called department, the group name, which would be financial aid, and then we added a suffix called team at the end of it. So what is it going to finally look like? Business school, financial aid, team. That's the name of the team that it's going to be, even though the user has entered in financial aid. And then lastly, I'll, I want to point out is you do have the ability to link your organizational, your organization's guidelines uh, as part of that link there, which talks about acceptable use cases, EULA, you own the, the data not to be used for this, et cetera, et cetera. Users are not required to accept that. That's merely there as a reference point. Now at this time, you know, we, we don't want to repeat the, the sins of the past, as if you will, as we don't want uh, file shares being stuck around forever as they traditionally have done. So we also don't want teams to stick around forever and ever and ever. If you implement the expiration policy, you can expire teams that are not being used. So you can define a, a period of time, 180 days, 365 days, in which the automatic cleanup or the, the, the renewal process will begin. 
Now, the typical behavior is if we do not recognize an intentional action for that team, so meaning somebody has gone into it, they've clicked on a channel, they've done a reaction, they've done something to prove that this team is still active, we will email the owners 30 days, 15 days, and one day prior to expiration, letting them know, hey, your group is about to expire, your group is about to expire. They will also get a visual indicator on the team itself. It's, it's in the form of a, a yellow triangle to uh, manually renew the team. If the owner of the team is, if there, if none of the owners of the team have an account anymore, or they've, they've gone out of your, uh, your directory, administrators much, must configure a catch-all email address in which they will receive the emails saying, this team is about to expire, this team is about to expire, action it. And then at that time, administrators can decide to manually uh, manually uh, delete it, they can archive it, they can choose to uh, just let it run its course. One of the relatively new features we've released is if we recognize 45 days before renewal that the team is active, people are doing things in that team, we won't go through that process. We'll just automatically renew the team on behalf of the of the team owners, so they don't get that that noise uh, for them. Now, if teams uh, do get deleted, the the team owners uh, or the IT administrators have 30 days to restore that team in full, right? I'm going to go to a little bit. I'm going to fast forward a couple slides and really talk about a little bit of automation, right? Um, teams can be used across multiple areas of of an institution. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to talk about School Data Sync. School Data Sync is our is our tool that reads your SIS information, either in form of a one roster API for generally the K-12 audience or a uh, or a CSV file, and we will then automatically provision teams based on the roster information. We also have a life cycle approach so we can take care of uh, additions and drops of the team. We also at the end of the semester or whatever term you define, we can rename the team, remove uh, the members from the team uh, as well as automatically archive the team. So next semester we can repeat the same process again, again pulling from your 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 sys uh, if you will. Uh, for those of you that are interested in this, you can go to sds.microsoft.com. There's a lot of great documentation there. If you need some assistance, you can sign up uh, and the team will, will reach out to you to provide some of that uh, assistance as well. Fair warning, given the current state that we're in, they are getting a, a bit bogged down. Um, so my suggestion to institutions, if you're really interested in this space, look at the documentation first. Um, it, it is great, pretty self-explanatory in my opinion. Uh, and then from there, we can once once an engineer does engage with you, you have a list of defined questions of I, I set it up this, but this, 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 this versus starting from from you, right? It really helps you accelerate the uh, the conversation a little bit more. And a couple of quick questions just as you're going through this. Can we change the the uh, order of formatting of the name example team department group? Uh, yes, you can. So you can add this the a text uh, at the, as a prefix and then the department as a suffix as well, right? I will I will call it a best practice if I will. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So just because you can create a prefix, probably not the best thing to do because it ends up coming noise. Generally, when I talk to administrators, the main purpose of implementing a naming policy is to clearly differentiate whether it's a self-service team or whether it's an administrative created team. So I generally say, Put it at the end and do a quick indicator like a dash s or a dash group or, or a dash you know department name something that highlights very quickly that okay this is not an administrative team or a, a team that an administrator has created I, I feel if you put it on the suffix or sorry the prefix it just becomes noise you know business school project a business school project b business school project c and then you potentially run into a, a path limitation uh, as well depending how long you use you know your prefix and suffixes Thanks, Manny. And then there was one other question that not everybody may see if they're not in the uh, team's channel. Does the SI, SIS group provisioning allow for private group creation so the membership is hidden? Um, you can answer that or something. That, that is an awesome question. When we when we leverage SDS, it creates a class team type. And automatically in a class team type, we do set the attribute uh, hidden group membership, and that prevents anybody outside of that class from seeing who is a member of that team. So that's automatic part of 
the class team type, uh, and then SDS only creates class team types in this in this scenario. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dave, can you just give me a quick reminder? Is this is a higher ed audience or more K-12 or just a mix of both? It's a mix of both. Um, All right. Cool. Yeah. Mix no, that's both. cool. I, I didn't want to I didn't want to talk about things that may not be applicable, but I will talk about a couple of things that I that a lot of folks uh, really like about about SDS and sort of how we're evolving the product. They do have what we call a holding pen. Uh, so a, at once you create a, a class, a faculty or a teacher can go in, create this uh, class to the way their standards. Students are not a member of those classes yet until they manually hit activate, and then they'll get this little pop up that says you're going about to activate the class. What also was good about this is obviously different teachers and faculties have different ways of using uh, the way they want to leverage technology. In this regard, you can create a a team for every course in your environment and if a faculty doesn't want to use it it's okay because of the holding pen students aren't given an, a, a sort of a blank canvas to space to go to go in uh, the other features that i'll discuss are really around those institutions that leverage power school as an sis so they can do great sync backs from within teams directly into power school uh, there is also uh, if you use sds there is also a, pe a parent teacher digest component uh, which parents or guardians that are listed in your sis get a weekly digest of you know these are sally's activities or assignments that they've that that has been completed this past week. This is what's forward that's been assigned to them, right? So very uh, useful information as well. Now, um, that's all around classroom, uh, the classroom side. There are also other ways of leveraging automation inside of Teams. The, you know, PowerShell and Graph API, both valuable, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Graph API is super, super, super uh, powerful. David, you gave out an example previously when Seth was there as part of the flow. You can automatically create channels and add applications as part of that. Really, all of that can be done through Graph API. Graph API allows you to not only create a team, but also allows you to clone a team. So you can take a team in its content as it exists and copy it over. You can define the channel structure. You can define the applications that you want as part of that team. Uh, you can also post a welcome message all automatically through Graph API. Very, very powerful tool, but in this table here, you'll see a quick differentiator of what PowerShell can currently do and what Graph API can do. For those who just need a very simplistic, I want to create a team, I want to add members, I want to add a couple channels, and I want to be able to delete the team afterwards, PowerShell is the way to go. For those of you that want a little bit more uh, granularity and uh, extensibility, I would say Graph API uh, is the way to go. I'm going to back that out before I get into the next piece of it. Are there any more questions, Dave? No, I think we're doing good. So, um, hold on, I see one more. Th let me see, one more thing came in. It's probably just Preston giving me a hard time about something. Nope, you're good. Keep going. Thank you. All right, so the next piece, the next about uh, five to ten minutes or so, we're talking about policies. Uh, policies within teams are very granular right you can apply a different set of policies to every single set of individuals across your institution if you choose to within the teams admin portal this is admin.teams.microsoft.com if you expand teams you're able to see manage teams within manage teams you'll see a list of all your teams the privacy settings the number of channels etc once you click on a team it gives you the ability to make settings on that team. This is a way if you want to do it graphically, if you don't want to use some of the automation tools uh, in the back end. Teams policies uh, is a way for you to define what the global teams policies are, whether you want people to make their teams discoverable or not. Um, one thing I will clarify, each section has its own policies. Once you've defined a policy, those policies need to be applied. They do not just, they do not default apply except for the global org wide default policies. When you click on a policy, in this example, it's a Teams policy. So globally, it'll say for these sets of users, do you want them to discover private teams? Yes or no. And do you want them to be able to create private channels? Yes or no. Because this is a global org-wide policy, 
this will by default apply to everybody. The other, if I were to continue on to our meetings uh, policies, you'll see that there is a global org wide default policies. We can edit the default policies to be. I would my suggestion is going through a list of all the org wide policies to make it the most restrictive. The reason is as as you add more and more people or as more students uh, join your organization, they get this org wide policy by default, and that is a, a more restrictive policy. Then you can create additional policies to then expand the experience. The policy that gets applied closest to the user is the one that takes precedence. So we've created another policy uh, in this example. I think we have one here called testing policy and I applied it directly to David. David will get the results of the testing policy, even if it is least restrictive than the, the global policies, if you will. So uh, my recommendation when I when I work with uh, institutions, I would say, listen, click on a user. You'll see a tab here called policies. Here you will list off all the policies that we have uh, within Microsoft Teams. Click on each one of these policies and ensure you are comfortable with the settings that apply to everybody. We do highlight and we did highlight some suggested policies for uh, remote learning particularly in a K-12 environment. And Dave, I'll send you this resource out so you can share it out Thank with you. the community. So messaging policies, turn off, uh, turn on translate, turn off urgent messaging, turn off chat, remove the meet now, remove private meeting as part of uh, your default policies. Then you can create a new policy which will uh, then be applied to, let's say, staff and faculty. With a few minutes left, I do want to highlight. Typically, when I go through this, institutions are like, wow, this is this is just super complicated, man. You're like you need to make it simple for me. So we've recently come out with this uh, what we call policy packages, and we've defined a set of policy packages. So you can say if I am a, a, a institute education for higher education students, I will have a policy called education underscore higher education student. And these are the policies that you can adjust. And then you apply the policy pack to the student instead of these individual policies um, to make it simple. So as you adjust these individual policies, whoever has the policy pack applied to them, they automatically get those uh, settings. Now, this is usually the part of the conversation that says, can you apply policies to security groups? Unfortunately, at this minute, we cannot. It is upcoming. But what we have done is we've, we've improved the functionality to improve to apply policies to a large number of users. Uh, this is what we call bulk policy assignments, where you can uh, apply policies to up to 20,000 users. Uh, at, at a single moment. This document here, which I will again share with, uh, with with David, is specifically designed for education where you can look at the license type. So you can see whether this is faculty or whether they are students. You can take the license uh, type that is students. You can get a list of all the users and then you will then apply policies to those users in batches of 20,000 at a time you can see here we have you know if you have more than 20,000 this is that the loop that just runs time and time again uh, group policy assignments to a security group is on uh, is is on the, the roadmap there is no you know no committed time uh, timeline for me to share with you uh, at this time it was a lot of information given you know the 20 minutes that I've spoken to David is there any questions that have come in or in the last 10 minutes are there any questions that people want me to double click on or reiterate and then Preston from what you're hearing from your Preston and Dave the customers anything you guys want me to address uh, in our time together great um, Preston why don't you go first and then we'll maybe open up to some of the community and then um, following Preston I'll, I'll have a quick uh, quick ask just to see kind of the things that we're getting asked Manny and kind of seeing what that intersection looks like from uh, you know places like Penn State and I know a few other organizations that you're interacting with. 
So I, I think Akash had a question that I want to get your opinion on here, Manny. I attempted to answer it, but is there a way now or in the near future to use abbreviations for a department as a prefix in a team naming policy? For instance, our department name and the attribute is Office of Information Technology. We want to use a prefix like OIT in the naming. So there are six Active Directory AAD attributes that you can leverage. So usually what I ask institutions is, and I don't have those off the top of my head, department was just one example. If there are, if there is one of those attributes that are currently empty, you could add the abbreviation to that, excuse me, that attribute, and then use that as part of your naming policy. Perfect. And the alternative I put in there is to build your own workflow to create the groups where you handle all that yourself, but that would change the end user's experience and how they create a team or an Office 365 group because you would have to restrict them and then manage that through your own ticket yeah, process. And, and, and every, every institution is different in how they want to manage team creation. I'm, you know, especially in higher education, I'm on the boat that the service should be available with the necessary uh, guidelines and governance to make IT comfortable with that restriction. And K-12 is a completely different story. But yes, you could adjust, absolutely adjust that workflow. My only, uh, I, as I'm thinking about it, that's a manual process. So if there's new departments or new new abbreviations that come up, that's going to have to get adjusted as, as part of that. Definitely. Yeah, and usually what I find when I speak to institutions, particularly around this, they have a provisioning process already, right? Whether it's Workday, whether it's SAP or whatever that is, it's just a matter of adjusting the, the current provisioning process to append that, and then it flows directly through. Excellent. Um, so one of the things, Manny, uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of that, you know, folks have various uh, SIS systems, they have various... Um, distance learning, like it's Blackboard, Canvas, Schoology, on and on and on. Um, I, I've, I've seen, at least in the customers that I've been dealing with, mostly in the Northeast, um, some K through 12s down in New York City area, but you know, there, there's um, folks that are all in, in the SDS, OneNote, school data sync area. You know, there, there's some, some, you know, really good documentation as well as lesson plans around helping students in those areas, right? And, and using that for your grading, using that for your workspace, very nimble environment, takes a little bit to get it, to get used to it. Um, but then there's also this other space, right? Which is, hey, we have all these tools, you know, we can use Teams as a platform and, and really build off of that. And so it may not be everything that you need in terms of your, um, you know, what tools you may be using within your organization, but it fills a lot of needs and spaces that are in between some of those applications. So I had um, was working with one school today that you know was using uh, one of the one of the other uh, kind of distance learning applications that they had. Um, you know they're spending a lot of time now having to train professors, right? And there's all this stuff that's going on in our environments, right? So we're training people, we're training technical people, we're getting end users used to that experience. That experience is going to be very very it's going to be variable. But Teams kind of has this, you know, a, a common interface. People are generally used to using it. Um, if they're using some of the other things that are out there in terms of, um, you know, voice over IP and, um, you know, dynamic meeting spaces, being able to meet now, group projects, collaboration, along with everything else that you're using in Office 365. So you may not have all the answers. Uh, you know, they don't have all the answers yet. And, and, and we're kind of building the plane while they're trying to fly it as well and around some of these remote learning capabilities. But you know whether you choose to go all in with SDS and, and OneNote, or if you try to go and fill in some of the holes that you have in some of your existing infrastructure, it's a really good tool. And I, and I can't tell you, you know, how powerful it can be in terms of getting some of, these school, some of your students and professors back in touch with kind of that learning environment. So in New York State, SUNY and CUNY, um, two million students, you know, there's a there's a wide hodgepodge of stuff that they're using to support those students, but many of the schools are going to be leveraging teams to quickly connect with those students, connect the professors with those students so they don't have an interruption to learning. They may even be teaching another SIS distance learning application, but a lot of the work is going to be taking place inside of teams and the channels that they're setting up. So I just I, I, I don't know if you've seen that same thing, Preston. Um, but so, I wanted so to let, let me touch. Out yeah, let me touch base on that in a couple of minutes we have left. So you're right. Yep. I mean, listen, people have choice. There's a lot of there's a lot of options to continue the the remote learning, and ultimately, we just want to make sure the students get their education right. Um, 
Teams has meetings, whether you choose to use Teams meetings or not, whether your institution's a Zoom uh, environment. Again, we're not going to tell you what to use. What usually this slide are, uh, really resonates a lot with the academic technology spaces is, you know, hey, you're going to use Zoom for meetings. That's fine. You're used to it. It's plugged into your LMS, not a problem, which, by the way, we have a Zoom app inside a team so you can join teams meetings zoom meetings inside of teams you can start zoom meetings inside of teams what teams gives you is the other side right that digital learning platform the chat the files pieces if you want to do it embedding additional video that mobile first space to continue the conversation right D teaching is not just hey friday 9 to 10 a.m this is the course and that's it it's that extended learning environment as well. So David, as you said, we either, you know, sort of all in or you're getting started in this space. Wherever you feel you are, Teams has a has a play to that. There's four minutes left. I feel I just realized I missed a super important part of the conversation. That was I talked a lot about governance and administration. I talked a lot about classroom delivery. But there's whole other parts of, of education, right? That's that's the staff and administration. So a lot of what we have is how to master working from home with Microsoft Teams, how to run more effective meetings using Microsoft Teams, especially those individuals who are relatively new to Microsoft Teams, who don't, who don't use it on a regular basis. And continuing on to the example that Seth gave around leveraging Teams as a platform. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The cellular customer you have called is not available at this time. Please try your call again later. Zero. All right, Manny, please unmute yourself. I muted everyone. All right. Um, so extending the exactly what uh, Seth was talking about, we've actually created, I work with a number of institutions that have created their own personal branded bot or application, if you will, and placed it and pinned it inside a team. So when they go into it, they can see their university's uh, team's support page. They have linked to how-to videos directly from Microsoft. So you can see short 90-second to two-minute videos on how to start a chat. Uh, we have a what's new guide directly embedded in here. I've seen institutions add a Q&A bot as part of this. So people can in friendly uh, language start typing, what is Teams? How do I start a chat conversation? How do I get help? And the Q&A bot pair will just give back the answer. So it minimizes help desk cost. And I've seen a couple institutions that have really embraced this where they've added in an integration to service now. So as they're going their Q&A pair, it responds saying, was this the right answer? And if a user selects no, it automatically kicks off a, a ticketing process to which the user can get help, right? So Teams, you know, a lot of folks look at Teams and say it's an application. And yes, there are, so, people can look at it. Teams is a platform and we can really customize that experience to minimize the, uh, the friction for onboarding of users. And this is just an example of how you can do so. All right, so I'm gonna pause here. We've got two minutes left. Any other questions? Yeah, take a little more time if need be, so if people have Okay, I, I just wanna... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna see if there's any, any questions in, in that regard. So yes, academic, there's a lot of resources uh, that we have, but I also do wanna call out that if, if institutions are saying, work from home policy, we do have a series of webinars that can support them through running effective meetings through Microsoft Teams like Preston and Dave do on a regular basis, mastering working from home, uh, best practices, the flow, uh, and then from an IT administration perspective, you know, really how does that onboarding process work? What is the support cost for us by leveraging the platform as a whole? You can brand this for your logo, your name, and have your links embedded in this application to minimize the cost, so. Excellent, Manny. Th thank you. Um, do you have other things that you wanted to highlight, Manny, at this point, or do we want to open it up a little bit more? I mean, you know me. I can I can go. For I, I know you'll keep going. Okay, <laughs> let, 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 let me put some bookends there. So, okay. um, so, so I know you'll keep going, um, and I want you to keep going, but let's just uh, l let's put a pause in there now. Um, because the minute that somebody at Microsoft gets a beard, all of a sudden they want to start talking a lot. Um, although, Preston, I'm very proud of you for the last 22 minutes. Um, and I'm, I, I'm hoping you're giggling there. So um, just to MS Office Hours community, I'd love to, a couple of you to just come off mute. Um, kind of how, how are you dealing with um, this, this specter of having remote learning today? Um, what are some of the things that you've crossed? What are the things that 
you've discovered? Are you using Teams as part of that scenario? Um, you know, if anybody wants to volunteer, um, or I or I get to pick on some of the usual suspects. We'd be happy because I'd really like to share, you know, your experiences with with your, you know, with your folks um, in your in your own community. OK, I'm going to start picking on people. Greg, what are you doing down in Atlanta? Greg Murphy. If you're still on. Why don't we why don't we end the uh, recording, Preston? So maybe okay. that, that's why people are bashful. All right, hold on. I'm going to stop it now. Give me just a second.